Thank you all for coming to this session. It has a very fancy title, which is in your blurb. It's actually about woke capitalism. Uh, and uh, we have a number of very excellent speakers here who are going to ex introduce this discussion. And I, I do mean introduce, because after they've spoken, then you all get to speak. Not all at the same time, one at a time. And then hopefully we can have a, a meaningful interchange of opinions about this very complex and very topical subject. So, the speakers in which they're going to, in the order in which they're going to speak, is first of all on my far left, Professor Vicky Price. It's not often referred to as that, by the way. A Chief Economic Advisor and Board Member of the Centre for Economics and Business Research and the author of Women Versus Capitalism. The second speaker will be this gentleman to my immediate right, Constantine Kissin, who is a comedian. Uh, he is the crea creator and co-host of the Trigonometry YouTube show and the author of An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West. On my immediate left is Professor Diane Wei-Ling Liang, who is a professor of business and the author of The Eye of Jade and Lake with No Name. This lady here, is Laura Vera Nelson, who is a political consultant, the founder and director of the Foundation for Uyghur Freedom, and the former director of policy and research for Labour League. And the last but not least is the gentleman to my far right, Professor James Woodhausen, who is a visiting professor of London South Bank University, the co-author of Energize, A Future for Ener Energy Innovation, and the co-author of Why Is Construction So Backward? They're going to speak for about five minutes. Rob Lyons is going to shut them up after that, even if I want to be more tolerant, won't be allowed. Uh, and uh, off we go. Vicky. Thank you very much. Um, the first thing I did, of course, is look up the definition of what woke means. Uh, as we know, woke basically means being awake. Uh, and that was what it was originally uh, used as. But then if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, it tells you that what the definition had evolved into being, and right up to what's been going on in the last few years, is simply being well-informed and being up-to-date. So basically awake to what's going on around you. So it made perfect sense. But of course, it's now transformed itself into signifying being alert to racial or social discrimination and injustice. And quite a lot of the protests that we're seeing right now, whether it's got to do with Insulate, Britain, or Extinction Rebellion, or anything else, uh, is a reflection of that. But of course, also taking the knee and Black Lives Matter, uh, all those are issues that uh, companies are much more aware of now than perhaps they were before. And of course, quite a lot of what they do is occasionally interrupted by protests uh, along the lines that I described, but also uh, they're aware that there is so much more transparency right now that they have to behave as well in a slightly different way than they did before. And of course, they have adapted up to a point. Uh, it's good for business if consumers still want to buy your products, if uh, the government isn't attacking you for whatever reason, such as pollution. Um, or, uh, of course, if the banks continue to lend to you, uh, although, of course, they become increasingly worried about whatever a firm may be doing uh, and whether it is sustainable in the long term. So it matters uh, for business, and it matters very significantly. Uh, so that's fine as it stands. But one question is, how much is actually done in reality? Uh, firms right now have to uh, prove they are doing all sorts of things in the right way. There's a lot of box ticking that takes place. We've seen a lot of accusations of greenwashing, for example, that's happening right now. Uh, and of course, firms have to explain themselves. We saw the issues with Boohoo. Uh, and the accusations of, sli of slave labor uh, for producing their products. They, of course, reacted and, and dealt with it in a certain way, and that has helped them. We've seen the attacks on Amazon. The interesting thing is with them, about three years ago, there was a big panorama program which showed how uh, poorly people were treated in warehouses, uh, whether they dealt with that, and they dealt with that effectively. Uh, three years later, in fact, just a couple of months ago, there was another big um, show uh, that highlighted the fact that delivery drivers truck drivers, of whom we have a huge shortage, of course, right now, uh, were appallingly badly treated, treated, apparently, by Amazon, and they, of course, have had to deal with it, too. So it may, therefore, look like it's pretty bitty. Firms have to fill in all these 
forms, all this box ticking that's going on right now, which is added to, of course, because they have to also prove not just that they're treating the people properly, they have uh, courses for racial uh, and also general unconscious bias that exists in organisations. They have to prove all sorts of things in terms of their energy uh, and carbon footprint. So it is becoming quite a big industry. Now, who can afford to do that? You know, there are two, th well, three things that worry me. First of all, that not very many can, and it requires an investment, particularly smaller firms that really cannot do it. Uh, and what tends to happen, of course, is that uh, you just try and cover up just the little small points that uh, emerge every now and then, rather than doing anything fundamental with the organization. So it's costly, it requires investment. Uh, quite a lot of firms, as a result, and that is very interesting in terms of looking at what's happened recently, move from being public, where you can uh, have shareholders uh, concerned about what you do, where you have a lot of transparency of what goes on, they're moving into, into private hands. So hedge funds buy them, and then you've no idea what's happening. Look at Morrison's, for example, right now, which may be moving from being a really good company to something else that we're not going to know probably uh, very much of. The second thing is quite a lot of companies like Nike, for example, are um, putting a lot of money into supporting woke uh, issues, such as uh, taking the knee, what happens to all the other money that companies have tended to put in uh, charitable um, areas? So is that just money being transferred from one to the other? The third thing is, given that it is quite costly, are we going to find that actually all these uh, issues become a barrier to entry for other firms? So are we going to have a lot more concentration in uh, sectors, which means a lot less competition. They may be behaving well, but you don't have any competition or low, or low cost, perhaps, or any pressure to innovate uh, as a result of that. Um, and finally, really, you know, what happens in relation to uh, finances, where they might be going in the future? Are we going to have the finance community deciding who is woke and who isn't, uh, or even government in terms of regulation and who is... Uh, again, woke and who isn't. So it may well lead to a lot less democratic and market functioning that we would like to see happen as a result of the intensification of the woke culture. Thank you. I was going to say keep your applause to the end. Anyway, Constantine. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I'm glad that Vicky started by de defining uh, the, the word work because I'd like to add to I mean, I'm someone who's obviously been quite critical of uh, this ideology. And I think one of the reasons is that I see it more than just people being awake to prejudice, but rather uh, about social engineering. And there's plenty of business and economics experts on the panel, so I'll leave all that stuff to them. But I was thinking, what is the underlying societal and psychological factor or the, the, the range of factors that are causing this stuff to happen. Why is it that all of our institutions are now expected to do social engineering? Right? The job of the police is no longer to stop and prevent and deal with crime. It's also to have rainbow-colored cars. The job of the civil service is no longer just to administer the local council. It's to have rainbow-colored pedestrian crossings. I, I know it feels like I'm banging on a particular issue, but, uh, but more broadly, why is it that all our institutions are now expected to engineer how we think? Um, and, and I think part of the reason for that is technology, actually. Uh, we have been extraordinarily successful uh, in, the, in the last 30, 40 years at solving many of the problems that humanity used to take for granted as something that's unsolvable. If you look at our response to COVID, uh, people 200, 300, 400 years ago would have taken COVID as something that happened to them that they had to endure. We now believe that we can fix these problems, and quite rightly so. And I think one of the reasons we're so obsessed with social engineering in every institution that we have is we have this general attitude that we can fix anything. Right? And I think that's probably a big part of where this all comes from. And so to me, the question really isn't why are corporations becoming woke. The question is why is everything now being perceived through the filter of how much are you doing for the rights of minorities when in the past you would have just been making cars or widgets or whatever it is. So, that's part of it. Another part of it, obviously, uh, is social media. Now, we've always had mental illness, uh, but social media is made into a competitive sport. Uh, right. And I think that's probably a big factor in that as well. And of course, it creates perverse incentives within the corporations themselves. If you employ a person who manages your social media, uh, then whenever anything happens that may, may affect your social media reputation or whatever, there's a person there with a vested interest in dealing with it in a particular 
particular way. I don't know how many of you have seen Dave Chappelle's latest special. He talks about how he was dragged on Twitter, and he said, I didn't give a shit because Twitter isn't a real place. Right? Well, if you are working for a corporation and your job is to manage that company's social media, you can't take that attitude because you're, you're, you're sort of being reasonable and by being reasonable, you're, you're talking yourself out of a job. You have to take it seriously. You have to believe that Twitter is real, it's the real world, and everything that happens there must be taken seriously. So I think a big part of it is the social media factor, which creates this impression that lots of people are, are doing something. As someone who's been on the end of social media mobs a number of times, I can tell you it's a very small number of people who are largely irrelevant, right? But a company isn't going to treat it that way because their perception, their experience is that this is a massive mob that's coming after you and you have to do something. And you've employed people whose job it is to tell you that you have to do something. So I think a lot of that pressure is the product of the technology uh, that came with social media. Now, the third thing, and this is where I finally get to blame my parents for something. Um, you know, the, the generation, I'm, I'm, I'm in my late 30s. Yeah, I, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, in, I'm in my late 30s, and, and my, my parents' generation, I, I'm from Russia, so it's very different for me. They weren't uh, that uh, per, permissive. But, you know, if you go out to your local park anywhere, there's not any in London, but if you go out to a local park in a small town, wherever you are, uh, you, what you actually observe, if you pay attention carefully enough, is a bunch of children being chased by adults who take instructions from them, right? So my generations and, young, and younger are basically a bunch of people who've spent their entire life since they could talk telling their parents what to do, right? Uh, and I think that's a big part of it. And by the way, I blame the parents for that, not the children. It's their fault for, for the way that they've, they've done it. So essentially, we've gone through life, and I see this uh, with trigonometry. It's essentially become a small business, my YouTube channel. We have young people working for us. And the expectations of the level of input that a junior person in an organization now has is incredible to me uh, as a sort of older millennial. Uh, I never thought that I would come into a small company and sort of be heavily involved in the senior decisions of that business. But younger people now expect it, and we sort of allow it as well. right? So I think that's probably playing a big part. Basically, parenting uh, is, is had a huge impact on that. And the, the, the other dimension of this parenting aspect, I think, is you saw it with uh, BLM and Piers Morgan. Piers Morgan was obviously extremely outspoken throughout the pandemic about the need for people to follow the rules, to stay at home, to do all those things. The moment his son went on a BLM march, he threw that out of the window and started talking about how proud he is of his son. Thank you. So I think we've got a generation of parents and older people who are terrified of upsetting their kids. Uh, and, and I think we sort of feel that on a societal level as well. Um, so I, I think it's really the parents' fault. Um, <laughs> And, and it extends to a bigger thing, which is, I think, in the West, and this is what I, my book, which is coming out next year, is about, we just feel very guilty uh, because we're extraordinarily successful, we're extraordinarily prosperous, and, and it's sort of like we've bought into this idea that because people have different outcomes in life, that somehow means that life is, you know, we, there's some discrimination happening, then it's unfairness, etc. We're really uncomfortable with being successful. So you've got a bunch of 50-year-old uh, white CEOs who feel really guilty, and they've got their kids at home telling them they need to be woke. I think that's probably the biggest part of it, to, together with technology. Thank you. <laughs> Diane, how uh, to follow? Uh, exactly, to follow a chief economist and a comedian. Thank you so much for giving me this order. And, I warned you. And as a, a conscientious academic, I should have looked up the definition of vote uh, on Google. But my doctor always said, never Google anything. You'd be terrified. So <laughs> I decided not to do it. So I've come with the attitude, I'm here to learn what wokeness is. I have no clue. But I do know that corporate responsibility, it's something that's been around for a long time, 20, 30 years minimum. And if you look at the annual reports of many large companies, Fortune 500, there's always a section about corporate responsibilities. And why so? Because, well, I might, I don't understand, you know, what wokeness is, but Perhaps I understand a little bit since I've spent a lot of time studying it and teaching what capitalism is. Um, it is corporate responsibility to produce services, produ production, uh, employment, uh, et cetera, but 
in the meantime, a corporation does have responsibility toward environment, the community within which they have their production, for example, where they hire their label. So these are the complex issues there. Um, is a company's job to be woke? Um, I think I'm a centrist. I would say no, because a company's position, a company, a business can provide the best, advance our civilization by following capitalism, production, services, and em employment, and generally improving the lifestyles and like living standards of uh, everyone. In, in fact, if you, yeah, going back to what, uh, uh, yeah, COVID, COVID, uh, COVID issue, and, and a, a constant as well, of you course. You COVID if you want. <laughs> uh, we have dealt with COVID as a society, as global community, in such a way that perhaps in the past would have taken us 20 years. And now we have vaccines, and we have treatments, and we seem to come, be coming to some sort of, you know, I would say conclusion, but some sort of arrangement with the virus to allow us to be here without masks, social distancing, having this debate. That success came from science, and came from scientific development, came from production, came from businesses taking on their responsibility as the provider of capital, as the provider of uh, services and, and goods, and that has enabled us to sit here and have this debate. And so my line is, yes, corporations need to be responsible, and, and a lot of corporations do so because more and more so, the shareholders are demanding that, the consumers are demanding that. Um, and if we look at that in our material, the, the ad from Nike uh, calling Kaepernick and the um, black um, athlete, NFL, 49ers quarterback, ex quarterback who took the knee and started a whole movement. Uh, Black Lives Matters and etc. And Nike did an ad with Kaepernick, and it was a controversy. Controversy, and you've all seen um, the anti-Nike, anti you know, taking the knee movement. Consumers uh, were burning Nike shoes, while the other side were buying Nike goods. Um, but. What the, at the end of the day was for Nike, it made Nike about $6 billion. And Nike has done that throughout the entire life of Nike. N uh, Nike, they thrive on cons uh, controversy because they're a consumer goods company. And the controversy makes good business sense. So when we look at what companies are doing today, we do need to look at, are they doing it because it's politically correct, or are they doing it because the market is demanding that, consumers and shareholders are demanding that. Only when it's the last case, the second case, then it's a sustainable, then it will make difference to our lives and to the lives of everyone living. Thanks. That, that's really, really great, Diane, and I, I think giving, giving this whole issue some historical context is very important. We have to remember that the, the free market economist Milton Friedman felt the need to write a book in the early 1970s attacking the idea that corporations should be concerned more with the environment, etc., than they should be with making profits. So this is... We're going back a long way now. I mean, I mean, obviously things change. It's not exactly the same. But there is a long historical process at work which has led to us getting to where we are. So thank, that's very helpful. Um, Laura. 
Hi, all. Um, I will say now from the outset that I am in my early 20s and I do fall into the stereotype of people my age believing in liberal values, which we have just trashed. So that's what I stand for. Um, I do, however, loathe the term woke and the way that it's so often used by people with different political agenda to tar vast swathes of the population with the same brush in an attempt to discredit their opinion. So whether being worn as a badge of honour or used as a disparaging remark, wokeness to me seems to be a toxic term. So a bit about me, I am a political consultant and, as was mentioned, worked for Labour Leave and the Brexit Party. But last year I founded a charity called the Foundation for Uyghur Freedom to raise awareness of the Uyghur genocide and act as a pressure on the political agenda and increase consumer awareness. What's become increasingly obvious in my charity work is that individuals, although many care and are concerned about what's happening, uh, feel disconnected from what is happening to the Uyghur population in China. So in January this year, I tilted the organization's focus towards consumer awareness by launching Boycott Made in China, uh, with the purpose of providing alternatives to people to buy from companies who do not use Uyghur slave labor, and to call out large corporations such as Zara and Nike for both their use of slave labor and their hypocrisy in claiming that they are ethical companies. I am naturally a cynic and have always been suspicious of the proclamations made by big corporations supporting so-called noble causes. However, the work I've done in the foundation with the help of great volunteers has solidified my belief that large corporations are hypocrites of the worst kind when it comes to wokeness. So Nike, which has been mentioned as an example, um, regularly assumes the position of woke czar or at least high up the woke company leaderboard using, as we've mentioned, Colin Kaepernick in their 2018 campaign. And regardless of the legitimacy of the cause that Nike choose to promote, they are hypocrites for presenting themselves as liberal, woke, and standing up to this injustice. Nike, alongside other companies, such as Apple, lobbied against the US Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. This year, yet again, they have been found to use Uyghur slave labor in the manufacturing of their products. Companies such as Nike thinly veil their immoral behavior through their expensive marketing campaigns with so-called woke leaders and through membership of organizations such as the Institute for Human Rights and Businesses Leadership Group for Responsible Recruitment and many other organizations with equally ridiculous names. And at the same time that Nike is preaching their progressive liberal sermons on a whole range of issues, they are enabling and financially supporting a genocide. Just to give you an example, Nike is one example of so many companies that I could have used in this explanation. And there are about 97 high street brands that use Uyghur forced labor in all of their products, or in many of their products. When thinking about this discussion today, I found myself thinking, what's the alternative? I came across the American wine brand, We The People. I watched their promotional video, which features Ronald Reagan asking, are we doing a good enough job teaching our children what America represents? interspersed with footage of Black Lives Matters protests and pro-choice advocates. Their website states they're dedicated to conservative values. Their wine is for American, made for Americans by Americans, American exceptionalism, free markets, free people, free speech and limited government. We the People takes things a step further and a portion of their profits support causes that reflect those values. If I'm honest, when I read this and saw this, my reaction was one of distaste and I felt slightly uncomfortable. Then I re-evaluated that thought process, and even though those views don't necessarily match mine, it's my choice not to buy their product. And this company is at least upfront and honest about what their views are, what political position they hold, and what causes they financially support. So why is it that companies like Nike, Volkswagen, and Apple not do the same? I've concluded that it's due to belief held by large swathes of the population that the woke causes these companies support are merely what society believes. And because companies such as the American wine brand have views that are different, they would be expected to absolutely emphatically disclose them. In fact, the phrase, it's just what society believes, was used by a friend of mine when I was discussing this panel today. She works for a large city company whose CEO sends all members of staff a weekly email discussing his take on current affairs. Although he wasn't always explicit in his stance, the snarky jokes about Brexit didn't leave much to the imagination. When I asked if these emails were at all frustrating, as they were imposing a set of beliefs onto a large corporation, my friend responded that a lot of his views were setting the culture of the company, and if they weren't believed by the staff, then they shouldn't work there. This comment was largely relating to issues of race, sexuality, and inclusion. And although I do inherently believe that an inclusive work environment is essential and often not achieved, 
it seems to me that his comments both fall wider than that and who draws the line on what is deemed obvious and inevitable to believe? After all, this is a large city firm, not an environmental charity or a human rights organisation. So why is it OK for the CEO to have a personal hotline to hundreds, if not thousands, of employees to discuss issues such as Afghanistan, Brexit or the environment? By doing this, the CEO marginalises anyone with a differing opinion and heavily implies there's one correct view. Although this email revelation was shocking to me, what was more insightful was the numbness to which they were received. So many young people I meet appear to be numb to the incessant opinions thrust upon them by those who deem themselves to be of superior moral enlightenment, under the illusion that the views they espouse are just what society believes. This conversation led me to think, it's just, is it just some of my friends who like woke companies? According to YouGov, six in 10 Brits like it when companies have a moral message and three in 10 think that they treat ethics and sustainability like a fad. I largely fall into both of these statistics. I think it is valuable for society if companies care more about than just their profits at the end of every month, particularly if it's at the expense of their employees and the world around them. However, there are two major caveats to that. Companies should be upfront and honest in the political positions they take, both to their consumers and their shareholders and potential shareholders, and their wokeness has to be genuine. For too long, companies have hidden behind pathetic, futile certifications to prove their morality whilst continuing to abuse other areas of society. If a company is to be woke, it cannot behave like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Thank you. James. Well, uh, speaking as a white privileged, five foot 11, heteronormative, binary, half Dutch, half Jewish, geriatric ex-executive. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're not gonna listen to anything else, but how many of you read the Harvard Business Review? Online, Yeah, well, I said read, didn't I? Yeah, well, there's a few saddos, but it's time that we all read it, because, uh, you know, woke capitalism is distinct from sort of woke as a social phenomenon. I hate the abbreviation. You know, I'm only using it for Rob and time. But it's really a big deal with the capitalist class, a word that we haven't heard yet. If you want to deal with the capitalist class, as I do, you've got to read the Harvard Business Review. And also, you've got to take notes. I know that's a fascist thing to say. I can't see enough people doing it just yet. But um, now... I think the historical context is very important. It actually goes back to a memo from the Stanford Research Institute in 1962 drawing the distinction between stakeholders and shareholders. And only when the times were right did that come out of a memo into academia in the 80s and Reagan wasn't very hospitable to it. And then much later it became into national discourse. And by the time you've been worked through all of George Bush uh, George W. Bush's presidential speech speeches, you'll find that he uh, refers to stakeholders nearly as much as Will Hutton on The Observer. <laughs> um, and then Obama pipped him at the post after that. So 1962 is the first date. The second date, ladies and gentlemen, is Margaret Thatcher in 1988 addressing the Royal Society and coining the phrase sustainable, or as I prefer it, sustainable. This was in the wake of the miners' strike, and it was an anticipation of the post-Cold War conditions in which green issues, health issues, and anything that wasn't to do with left and right really emerged. And coming from Thatcher, I think we can say I disagree with anybody who says the people out there believe it. They tell opinion polls they believe it, but it's a top-down phenomenon, ladies and gentlemen, and that is very important to understand. The end of the Cold War led to the Tony Blair third way because the only traction you could have with young people and with everybody was that if capitalism isn't working and it's the only game in town, we've got to change the agenda from left and right and we move into something else which is to do with morals, to do with personal identity and all the things that we're familiar with today. The end of the Cold War is often a cliche but in 1990, Frederick uh, Reichelt and his partner, Mr. Sasser, wrote a book, uh, wrote a Harvard Business Review article called Zero Defections Comes to Services. Now, we've heard a lot about technology. I don't buy it. And we've heard also 
uh, a lot about social media. I don't buy that. And I don't believe it's an economic phenomenon. It's true that in order to keep people on side of your service delivery, you don't want so many defections from them, and therefore you're looking for loyalty. And customer loyalty in all of our cards really grew up as a doctrine in the 90s to catch them young, because they worked out with net present value and all of that stuff you and I don't understand, that if you did a Disney on a six-year-old and he was still with you at 66, you'd make a shed load of the dosh. But it's not that economic foundation that's so uh, important. I think the key point, and I think Constantine is right on it there, is the Brent Spa uh, event in 1995. After Brent Spa, which was about taking a piss in the North Sea in terms of pollution, then Shell executives all over Holland and Germany started finding that their homes were firebombed and their kids didn't like them. And I think the kid factor and the demographic factor is very important because they do feel guilty. We pioneered guilt in Britain in the Victorian era. We had a whole sector of society devoted to, uh, to guilt. Let's not go there. But uh, that was really the key moment, I think, when business ethics bec uh, then morphed into the triple bottom line, what we have today, economic and social governance, and then also the trendy phrase of the moment, or yesterday, purpose. And that was a post-Cold War, no more class struggle, uh, demographic uh, development in which youth was a bit insp uh, inspirational. Uh, in 1995, how many of you have read um, Daniel Goleman's Emotional Intelligence? Right? That's a really important book. And in it, before his management bestseller, Primal Leadership, 2003, uh, followed by Resonant Leadership, uh, by his collaborators, he pioneered the idea that you had to be empathic. How many of you, hands up, would like to say, I'm not empathic? Come on. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, uh, let me tell you, I'm not empathic to the ruling class. I, you know, I, I confess. So really what we've got to say is, and I will conclude, is that what's going on here is you've got class differentiation where wokeness is a ticket upwards to become diversity manager in the NHS, a quarter of a million pounds a year. And if you, if you don't do that, you're going to be a nurse on 25,000 pounds a year. So let's recognize it for what it is. It's the formation of a new ruling class, a new priesthood, and I'm again it. Thank you. <laughs> Great, and I think that, that between them, the speakers have set, set out most of the key points that um, really we need to talk about. There's only one thing I would just say. Please remember this is about work and capitalism. It's not about wokery in general. Um, uh, so we need to focus on the, on the work corporation side of the, of, of the discussion, not what's going on at the local university. That's it. Other than that, you can say anything you like. So... Uh, speakers from the floor, please. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I just wondered what the uh, what the panel thought about uh, in general, because my my personal perspective is the fact that there's a real vested interest in a new industry that has sprung up around these topics. So, for example, we know for a fact that uh, in the U.S., uh, corporations spend about eight billion dollars a year on on diversity initiatives that don't actually move the dial and have, have the right kind of impact. Um, but, you know, if you take just a couple of examples, uh, Aunt Jemima, uh, Uncle Ben's, have taken a decision to uh, get rid of the, 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 their brands that have been so familiar to people like me growing up. So now, as a black person walking into a supermarket, they've taken out a black face out of, uh, out of, out of the shelves, which is kind of counterproductive. <laughs> So if it didn't work, I just wonder why um, they carry on doing it, because I know it's popular to say go work, go broke, but some of this stuff that's not really impactful and actually counterproductive just gets done and repeated all the time. And the lady mentioned Nike as well, that's making money out of this stuff, not having the right impact. We know banks in the city who you know, have the diversity initiatives, they've got three black people on the board, but they don't pay the cleaning staff a living wage. 
Um, and it's just that contradiction um, that's a lot of diminishing returns and who no one knows like they'll carry on doing it because there are no consequences um, and it doesn't really affect the bottom line. And they get worse at doing the things that are their core mission. So if you're making sneakers or you're making uh, widgets and you divert all of your attention to, to these initiatives, then you get worse at making widgets. So it's counterproductive in my view. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I want to say a little bit about uh, where the, um, the pressure to do this comes from. So I, I run a business, we employ about 350 people. Um, and I can tell you, if you want to pitch for any work from government, or for, I know you don't want to mention the universities, but or from the universities, mm. uh, or, or those sectors, you cannot get that work unless you've got a policy on pretty much everything. Uh, and not only do you have to have a policy, you can't just show them a bit of paper and say, yeah, I've got a policy. Uh, you have to say, you know, how do you prove you live up to that policy? You know, so you need to employ somebody to measure the extent to which you live up to that policy. So it's, it's actually now really hard to run a business without doing this, without doing things that you don't believe in um, and that you think are completely uh, inefficient, waste of time, useless. But you just cannot run a business without doing them. Mm. Now, you know, it, I know there's a, a, an argument, it's, you know, that it, it's a kind of capitalist class that's requiring this. But why does it require something that's just so inefficient? It's a waste of resources. It, it holds businesses back. It means we can't have proper competition because unless you're a certain size, you can't afford to do all this kind of stuff. So it's really, to me, problematic from a, a kind of running uh, business kind of uh, uh, viewpoint. Um, I just wanted to uh, bring up the point about um, stakeholder um, and shareholders. Um, shareholder maximization and it's kind of counterposed with uh, serving stakeholders. And it kind of is, the two are so kind of contrasted as the kind of the Friedman model, or well, well, before Friedman, but the idea of the, the corporation being a shareholder value maximization at all, at all costs compared to a, a nicer version of capitalism in which uh, the corporation serves some external stakeholders too and has a wider social purpose. And, and I think that this is often counterposed, but it, it doesn't really reflect the changing nature of ownership of capital in capitalism today. So right now, if you look at the biggest shareholders in the world, um, it's BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, the big uh, global asset managers often using index funds. They're the biggest shareholders of, uh, say, one company in the S&P 500. They're also the biggest shareholders in the other. And this kind of leads to a breakdown, really, of how, it, how the whole freedom model of the shareholder wanting to maximize the uh, value of his own holdings in his one company, because actually the biggest shareholder in this company is also the biggest shareholder in the next company, the next company, the next company. Now, this is, a, this is not a deterministic point. What happens, happens. But the idea, then, that actually... It, it kind of invites, you can read BlackRock talk about this, it invites a different perspective of these shareholders. They start to then think about what's good in aggregate for the economy, and then by extension, what's good for every stock price in the world as, as the owner of uh, a slice of every stock in the world. And so that then invites questions about policy level, economics, and also social justice, and those other questions. And there's all sorts of arguments they'll make about uh, pursuing this kind of purpose, and it will, it will lead to better in, in aggregate economic outcomes. And so I think this kind of recognizes, I don't, it, there's lots of other stuff going on with the whole woke um, aspects of corporations, a lot of marketing departments. But this change of ownership, I think, is probably fundamental to understanding why businesses are talking in different terms of how they used to. And the freedom uh, shareholder maximization models is increasingly attacked by everyone, it seems, you can't find a defender of it who is not uh, just you know, an, an opinion writer. Uh, and, and why this is kind of broken down. Great, thank you. Uh, but I think that there are two elements to this discussion. I'd quite like us to explore both of them. The first one is really about where is this coming from? Right? Is, it, is it top? Some people have said it's top down. Some people have said it's coming from the, con the consumers or from the children of the, of the executives or all this kind of stuff. So it would be nice to have a bit of a discussion about that. And the other, then the other big discussion is, is it a good or bad thing? Uh, or is it a mixture? So let's, let's try and focus on one or other of those. You don't have to do them sequentially. But anyway. Two separate uh, questions. One is, you've mentioned, people have mentioned stakeholders, 
and no one's really defined um, what they mean by that. We know what a shareholder is. Somebody like me, who's worked in small third sector places, you think they're our clients, they're the local community, uh, they're that kind of thing. But when we're talking about big corporations, who are we understanding by their, their um, stakeholders? Do we mean their workers? Do we mean the people who live in the area where they're doing their mining? And all that kind of thing. And I think there's uh, another separate thing which is that we are now seeing corporations, or business is the usual word, now being talked about as a group of victims, a little bit like individuals under COVID. Oh, we must look at what is happening to business now. They need a handout from government. You know, the fuel industry, the gas industry, there's something else. They've become part of the population who lay themselves out for sympathy. And so where does that fit in to all of this? Mm. That's a really excellent mm. point. Interesting. Yeah. Hi there. It's a, a good question. Where did it come from? So I was the chief exec of a PLC and had faced this over many years. And to be honest, I think it was shareholders, uh, shareholder pressure, because these decisions are made at board level, by and large. But what was amazing, it started about 2005 when HR, what you do is you park it in HR, and HR are really cat candied on this stuff. So suddenly they want to, uh, you know, they tell all the employees got set of values. It's usually some crap acronym where a letter four and five, nobody remembers any of this stuff, of course. Four and five were just made up to fit the acronym. Mm -hmm. Or they all begin with I or C. You know, C's were really popular. You know, community, collaboration, all that. All that. <laughs> then something really weird happened. Suddenly HR thought they had the right to interrogate people's unconscious. Even Freud struggled with that one. <laughs> you know, Peter and Paula from HR suddenly thought they could actually go inside your mind, into your unconscious, and diagnose your faults. So we had this notion of employees as having this amazing deficit. And Constantine was spot on here. It's social engineering, but it doesn't work. So read the Harvard Business Review. Read Frank Dobbins, who looked at this. 602 companies, massive longitudinal study. None of it works. But my friend at the back here was sort of right here, because the training is bullshit. It's a way of parking the problem and looking as though you're doing something. What really works is actual action by managers and getting people on the boards. So Dobbin's conclusion when he looked at all the empirical evidence was, listen, take some action here. Stop this bullshit value social engineering. It's a perfect word for this stuff because it, because it doesn't work. And what we're doing is deflecting the problem. You know, we're ignoring it. Because the people on the boards here don't give a shit about this really at PLC level. This is the truth. And I've sat in many of them. They don't give a shit because they're reacting to share price. And they want to keep that share price up by playing that game. So that's where it comes from. Honestly, I'm being a bit confessional here, but that's the truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I actually disagree with you on that because I, I work for one of the big four and I think that they do genuinely believe this stuff now. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and that's the problem that everybody in the uh, you know, big consultancies buy into all of this and you, know, you think, well, why is it that they're, that they're so embroiled in this stuff and they push this agenda and it does benefit people, you know, so, so they are pushing for more women partners and all of this sort of thing. And, and you, know, you can play the game and, and go along with it and get your partnership and that sort of thing. So that's, that's sort of good in a way. But I think, you know, I, I sort of, you know, and a few of us are these sort of lone voices that try and sort of just push gently back against this thing. And maybe mention class or, you know, other other factors that might be important here. And it's just tumbleweed. It's just, it just does not connect in any way. Because for, for these people, they think that race, gender, diversity, all of these things are the most defining, um, you know, the most important issues in society today. And, and class just doesn't figure at all. And I think the, the reason that the, the uh, you know, corporations can just go along with this is that it doesn't really cost them any. They, they genuinely believe it, and it doesn't cost them anything, so it's a win-win for them. And all of the other issues in society just get forgotten. So, so I, think, I don't think it's cynical. I don't think that they don't believe in it. I think they really do, and it you know, could be for all sorts of reasons, like guilt and all of those things. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think that the, the problem is there aren't, well, especially within the big corporations, most of them are middle class. So I, th I think you know, the point that James said, that you know, if you're sort of working a shop and you don't agree with it, you, you just have to go along with it. There's no, no pushback. 
gentleman here with the great haircut. I work in the technology sector, and so I heard different stories in the technology sector of uh, venture capital firms giving preferential funding to founders that are women, people of color, and minorities. Companies giving preferential hiring to candidates of different ethnicities. And companies spending millions on training their employees on white privilege and diversity. How some of these sort of practices are not considered themselves a form of discrimination by those that advocate in favor of them, it's absolutely astonishing to me. The question is, what leads these companies to ignore merit, productivity, and profits for the sake of diversity and inclusion? And I think the answer is simple, abundance. Despite of the COVID crisis, we are living in very good times. Businesses have the budget to afford to subsidize not the most oppressed, but the most entitled and the most incompetent. <laughs> it it is the abundance of wealth that is creating the illusion that equal economic outcomes for everyone are possible. And the only way that we can return to valuing productivity and merit above anything else is when a major crisis begins and scarcity, struggle, and sacrifice will be our only options. Thank you. I am going to now let you speak. Um, I'm just slightly concerned that we might be losing the Generation Zs in the audience here. So I'm particularly be interested in anybody who... Uh, I have a number of pe people in that generation working with me, and I do know that they do actually think quite differently about a lot of these uh, problems. Sorry, I'm not Gen Z. Uh, no. I work for a large city company, insurance company, and have all, all my life. Um, I think when we talk about woke, there's, there's many things people are putting up there. So the company I work for is actively disinvested from fossil fuels and foregone hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. So that's at one end. It's aimed for gender parity in all senior management positions and is doing gender parity in the interview panel. I think within two years they will have gender parity. So to say it's not having an effect isn't true. Then at the other extreme we have um, almost every time the CEO talks about LGBT stuff. I know it's going to be propaganda. I know it's going to be performative. I'm personally gender critical gay guy, so I know I'm going to hear a load of uh, propaganda that I don't disagree with. So that I disagree with. So I think I think it is real. I think it covers a wide sp spread of activity from highly active statements and investment decisions, all the way through to purely performative propaganda that. And my question on the pro performative propaganda is, whose voices do they listen to? Because I don't think it's my voice that will get listened to on LGBTQI. I think it's the subset of activists who have a particular ideology and a capture over that agenda. But it doesn't represent the workforce, let alone someone like me. Uh, I'm just, uh, uh, is there anybody up there? I've, I've seen you, anybody? I'm looking for somebody who's possibly the younger generation. I'm kind of mid-millennial level, so I guess with the silence in the back, I guess I'll have to do. Um, I think this is uh, primarily driven by kind of what, peop what businesses think consumers want. I think a lot of businesses are extremely re reactive to what they see in the market. And particularly when they're connected in terms of social media, they'll have social media marketing departments whose job really is to see what is trending on Instagram, on TikTok, etc. They see more kind of culturally woke things coming out there. And it's often kind of a, a very lazy form of marketing is to try and tap into the zeitgeist of what they think consumers want but don't necessarily want to invest in creating innovative and valuable products that actually help people's lives. Um, I see it as quite a simple thing, but uh, obviously there's many different layers to that. Thank you. Uh, so we're answering your question about where it comes from. I just want to highlight something about the it first, which will help answer that, I think. I mean, the it, while it does have a long, the it as in stakeholder capitalism, woke capitalism, whatever, it does have a long history as... Uh, Diane said, James said, others did, that there's been a long time coming in terms of stakeholder capitalism, corporate social responsibility, and so on. We can find that historical, uh, those historical precedents. But I think we should see that the it is something which is qualitatively different today 
you know, it's not just continuity, it's a big element of change because we've had what I would see as a sort of a reversal in the traditional division of labor in society, where in the past there used to be a clear division of labor between business and government and politics. You know, business was expected to stay out of politics, it was expected to stay out of social issues, it was expected, in fact, to stay pretty silent on things. Its job was to produce goods and services well and through that, you know, increase productivity, increase living standards. <laughs> Government's job was to take responsibility for those social matters. And it was a much sharper division until about, I'd say, about 30 years ago. Uh, 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 and increasingly over the last sort of 10 years, that division of labor has been turned almost upside down, where now businesses are in fact criticized if they don't take a stance on social issues. That it's to be silent on these things is to be ostracized because they should be taking responsibility. So as the answer as to where it's come from, look at the other side of that division of labor, I think. We would spend more time. Because while I agree with a lot that's been said as to what are the sort of internal drivers, the internal pressures on business to assume these social responsibilities, to encroach into uh, the, uh, 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 the arena of democratic politics. We should also be thinking about the other side as to what's opened up where these businesses have moved into. And there's been a retreat of traditional politics of the political class from dealing with all of these issues. I mean, very crudely, over the last 30 years, politicians have become much more uh, technocratic and managerial and just see their jobs as somehow you know, balancing the Treasury's books and have actually outsourced many of the responsibilities to the rest of society, including to business. So it's business that they have been told, whether it's through you know, privatizing of, uh, social care or whatever, or it's through they're being told that they should have to you know, pursue net zero policies or whatever. Governments have been telling businesses to assume these greater responsibilities as government has retreated from its traditional responsibilities. So I think we have to look at that pressure from the political side also in order for us to change this. Because I would just end by saying, I think this is extremely, this change, this reversal I've said, is extremely dangerous, not because it just doesn't work, but because it is extremely anti-democratic. It is actually helping to exclude the public from politics, because it's allowing non-elected corporate leaders to make decisions about our lives. It's removing us from the civic space and replacing them by the corporate boardroom. And that is extremely undemocratic. So that's another reason why it's important to review that division of labor, because we've got to get, not get back to the old politics, but get back to a situation where there is accountable politics, which we, the people, are involved in. And we're not expecting uh, you know, the Bezoses and so on of the world to solve our problems for us. I'm interested in how we take the premises of these things from the start. We accept, you know, someone will say there should be parity in this domain, there should be proportionality in an organization, and we always accept it as if uh, it, in itself it's, 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 it's to be done. We don't, I think what the cost of that is that we, we, we lose the sort of civilized toleration of differences. Mm -hmm. You know, the difference between men and women, or different people of different backgrounds or different races. You know, we, we, do, we do different things. We, we, this, this drive for absolute parity we take as red. Uh, just on what's driving, I think uh, I agree with the people that have said uh, middle class status appropriation is the main thing. And I confess I have quite a, quite a few low status opinions, I'm afraid. What I, what I find so interesting, um, and no one's mentioned it yet, is about commercials, commercialism. They've got commercials on TV that seem to say that there must be at least 85%. 90% black in the UK. All I see is these adverts now, every single time now, it's a black face, it's a black face. Now, I ain't got a problem with that. It's, it's fine. But I just find it slightly interesting. It has to be black. Can't be Chinese, can't be Indian, can't be disabled. It comes from Eastern Europe. It must be black. So I guess for me, it's all lives matter. But I know that's a dirty word now. It, only black lives matter. Everybody else can go to hell. Fair enough. <laughs> Okay, so um, from, from, what, uh, from what, uh, it seems to me, it basically looks like companies, much like political parties, are pursuing what is expedient. They are trying to please their, their crowd, like political parties. They, they're also pursuing wokeness because it's what they perceive to be the, one, the thing that will get them the most votes, people on their side. Much like Konstantin was saying, parents bending over backwards to please their children these days, which also touches on another issue, which 
that happens, that scenario happens, and you multiply that multi uh, for uh, lots of times of, uh, for a few years, you have a generation uh, of young adults who grew up with very poor examples of morality, or moral fiber, and consistency in ideas. But now back to, to the topic. So if companies pursue what is expedient and they think wokeness is expedient, could it be that we are going to have to somehow, uh, in, a, in a sort of official way, separate economy from state and also have to come up with some sort of pledge for companies to not be political, much like the army? As in, the individuals can do what they do, whatever they want in their personal time, but the companies cannot take a stance. Could, could it be that we're going to have to impose a scenario of that sort? It seems to me, listening to what people are saying, that the perfect business model today is one of absolute ruthlessness in terms of profit maximization and uh, a social justice wing um, that actually has impact at the level of media and society. Um, and so in, within that context, I'm going to take on what James has uh, said. I think that actually that balance between those two things, many companies actually aspire to. Uh, and I'll go back to the B word, for example, Benetton in the early 90s, who ran some of the most radical media and advertising campaigns to the extent that the famous uh, black woman with the white child at the breast was banned by um, London transport workers. And they continued in that vein, growing their com company through a, a campaign which was based around social justice and playing with imagery in terms of identity. So for me, there is something in the idea that actually if you can get that balance right, you can still make a lot of money. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes, I just wanted to bring us back to the uh, one um, word in the title, big business. Now what is big business today? In the past, it was General Motors and Standard Oil, uh, or possibly Citibank. It was making things or, um, or financing. What is it today? It's almost entirely, in the Western world, IT. I think the six most prosperous companies in the world are all in IT. And out of the 10 richest men in the world, only one was an investor, Buffett, and only one had anything to do with making anything. Um, virtually everyone was in IT. They're selling data. Now, is the, they are big business at the moment. You can even forget Shell and so on. They are amassing an enormous power base. Why are they doing it? And there's a difference, never happened before. In the past, the companies uh, wanted to please their shareholders. Now, um, Zuckerberg and co, they want to please the people who read them. Um, and that's a different audience, a very di different audience. They're also amassing enormous data on people. In theory, pretend if Zuckerberg went into politics, he would have a power base as great, if not greater, than the sort of people we're worried about, like Putin or, or, or the president of China. Because he'd have tabs on, on so many millions of people. He's selling stuff that people can't do without. And on top of that, he's going into other areas. The only area he hasn't got his hands on yet is money. And if he goes into Bitcoin, he's got that as well. So if there's any one person who you should beware of in the so-called free world, it's somebody like Zuckerberg. That's my Thank you. I'd, ju I'd just like to say that uh, there's a big current of determinism going through here, which I don't agree with. I, um, my, uh, Churchill said, we make our buildings, then they make us. Everybody always puts the emphasis on the second deterministic clause instead of human agency and sorting ourselves out, as Frank Ferretti said. Marx said, men make history, but not in circumstances of their own choosing. Our GCSC Marxists, the Corbynites, always put the accents on the second clause, not on the first, that we make history. Now, we've heard it's good for your social media presence, it's good for your marketing, uh, and all of these things, why do they do it when it's so inefficient and so on? They do it because they are facing and have faced a crisis of self-belief and an extreme aversion to taking risks about the future. 
It's a sociological phenomenon, not a technological or an economic one. And that's something that, you know, you may have missed it because I was talking too fast. In the Brent Spar episode, not just the demographic thing, you know, they felt bad about themselves, those Shell CEOs. They don't like themselves. And that's the fundamental thing that's driving it. On top of the government collapse with the end of the Cold War, that's not our job anymore. We'll outsource it all that Phil Mullen spoke about. Can we get that straight, please? Anything else is really vulgar. <laughs> and that, 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 that raises uh, another question which we might uh, want to address, which is what, what should we do? What should we do about it? We already heard from a lady over there that it's impossible to run a business these days unless you conform with this. It's probably impossible to speak your mind in many workplaces if you don't go along with the, the current uh, corporate culture as it, as it develops. So. What, if anything, should be done about it? Gentleman with the glasses. I don't have an answer to what we do. Mm -hmm. um, That's all right. But I do, I do know what we don't think we should do, is I don't think we should start, you know, the woke people going to Starbucks and the, everyone else going to a different company. Constantine, you made this point in your most recent one of the podcasts that mm -hmm. you released. It's like, that's not going to lead to a cohesive society and we'll end up just being divided and, as you said, Civil war, been a civil war, basically. So it's not the answer is not. Let's just all go our separate ways. We have to like work out other ways to do this. I'm still at university, so I I do watch a lot of these adverts. Like I went to the cinema the other day, and I saw three adverts with Kia and Volkswagen and another one all patting themselves on the back for um, stopping climate change. But as far as I can tell, it, it, it really... It's definitely stopped. And it was, um, it was Shell as well. Like, as far as... All advertising, like, they don't give a crap. Like, um, but I, I see it as, like, folded into more generally what advertising tries to say. It tries to sell your lifestyle. All car adverts and perfume adverts try and sell you, sell you to become a confident individual. Every single Vodafone advert is set in a maternity ward because getting this phone deal will help you connect with your family. And, you know, um, but these kind of ideas are not super negative. Stopping climate change, social justice, strong family, being confident. They're not negative. It's just very disingenuous. They don't, they don't care. But if we were to ban that, which I don't really think we can, what would replace it other than predatory apathy? You know, like, how, how can we move past it, we can't really replace it. I spent five years working in a US corporate, and I agree with the lady in the green over there that um, people in corporates are sincere in believing this stuff, and corporates also endorse it because they think it won't cost them anything. But actually, it might cost them something because more and more life of life is becoming contentious as you only have to reopen a newspaper to, to see. There's not many apolitical areas of life left. And by associating with some causes, it's increasingly likely that they will alienate uh, larger numbers of their customers. We saw some sort of signs of recognition of this in companies who initially endorsed BLM, uh, the BLM organization, but later withdrew their support when they realized there were some problems with it. So my question is, will the trend continue, or is there going to be a backlash or at least some um, reflection on the wisdom of attaching yourself to a particular political cause. I personally think that it's actually not coming from the corporations imposing it on the new labour coming in. I think it's coming from the workforce imposing it onto the corporations that they're joining. And now, I, I think the main reason that all this is happening is because the woke side have entirely monopolised our education and our skill base. I recently got qualified as a fire marshal and there were three modules in it. How to put out a fire, how to treat a burn victim and inclusivity in fire marshalling. <laughs> completely irrelevant. Every single person that is now being hired by a company, regardless of their own political beliefs, has been educated in being woke. You cannot get a skill these days without an inclusivity module being included in it. And I think that's where it's coming from. No matter what your beliefs are, you'll have at some point to get any form of skill had to have that form of education, that wokeism included in it, even if it's completely irrelevant in the actual skill you're learning. I think that's where it's coming from. You join a company, that company has to hire someone, but they can't hire anyone who hasn't been trained in that uh, ideology. So I think that's where it's coming from, personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, Laura said at the beginning that she was very much in favour of a lot of, um, a lot of these changes. 
Um, not necessarily the way they were brought in. Wow, way you threw me in that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I just, uh, I'm just, I'm just slightly worried that again that we're we're just assuming that there's something automatically wrong with with being made aware of uh, you know racial. Well, could I maybe explain what that well, wrong I'll thing is, if I may? A few things have been said. Uh, by the way, lots of brilliant points. I'm going to pick out only the ones I disagree with. Um, <laughs> Just to keep this civil. Um, no, but seriously, first of all, it's been said that, f f I can't remember who said it, uh, and I, it's not a personal thing, obviously. Wokeness is not liberal. Can we just get this, right? An ideology that says free speech is something that should be punished, that says that because I have dark skin or because I'm a first generation immigrant, I should be treated differently to the other people in this room, that the black people in here must be treated differently to the white people. There's nothing liberal about that. Yeah, yeah. That is not a liberal ideology, okay? <laughs> That is the antithesis of liberalism. It is the antithesis of the Western project, and it is destructive to the core of what Western civilization is. So that's the first thing, right? Can we get that? The second thing, which I made the point about social engineering, right? If this was representative of 80% of the population, I believe in democracy, right? If 80% of the population want to be woke, great. The problem is, all the stats show this is about 7 to 9% of the population in America, fewer in this country, right? So this is a tiny minority. It's the tail that's wagging the dog through the power that they have in the institution. So let's again not pretend that this is the view of the majority. This is a tiny group of people who've captured institutions and they're using them to deliver their agendas. The Scottish uh, gentleman was just making the point there, right? Uh, and the third thing uh, I think uh, the quote unquote man with the haircut made, which is about the bourgeois versus Marxism. Uh, let's be very clear, Marxism is a bourgeois ideology invented by bourgeois people, implemented by bourgeois people, because you have to be educated to believe the sort of stupidity. <laughs> and the people who implemented Marxism in the Soviet Union, where I was born and grew up, these were highly educated people, mostly imported from the West, by the way, right? So. That's the first thing. The other thing I wanted to say is about corporate responsibility. I think corporate responsibility is very important. I think companies shouldn't be able to dump toxic waste in the rivers, and I think that's great. There's a difference between forcing companies to be responsible for the actions that they take and forcing companies to brainwash their employees, right? There's a big difference. It's not the same thing. Um, well, I just want to say on the issue of Marxism, obviously it's kind of constructed, uh, predicated on the idea of the oppressed and the oppressor. But historically, the divide was based on class, but now, of course, the divide is based on racial background sexuality. So actually, I think it has everything to do with Marxism in the sense that we have the oppressed and the oppressor. It's just the dividing lines are no longer economic. Okay, so I think one of the common themes that we've noticed throughout everyone speaking here is hypocrisy. And I think what we've done is we've conflated the external actions that a business takes, so all of their marketing, so Nike's ads, etc and conflating it with all of their internal policies and practices. And so we're saying, okay, so none of these external marketing things are actually impactful. Um, I'm super liberal, I'm LGBT, I'm all of the things that everyone here hates. Um, <laughs> but I hate these ads, I hate these ads, I don't think they're constructive, I think policies are useful. I think these um, basically inclusivity programs and in corporations should be done, but I don't think they're good yet. And I think we're seeing that hypocrisy and that failure and frustration with these policies in everyone that's spoken here so far. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not actually teaching us anything. They're not helping us. And I think that's kind of at the issue of it. I think I agree with a lot of people here on that level that it's pretty much useless and we're seeing them be, we're seeing big businesses be extremely hypocritical and not caring for their employees or the people around them. Um, I just had a quick point about uh, the mention of inclusivity programs in corporations. Uh, I'm an empl employment lawyer, and usually those are implemented just to avoid litigation risk, not to be overly cynical about it, but <laughs> it wasn't mentioned yet, so. Mm. Uh, Hi, uh, I'm an auditor uh, by trade. And every time they bring in legislation like GDPR or Sarbanes-Oxley, I rub my hands with glee because it means more work. <laughs> and a lot of this, um, these policies are policed now by private companies. And private companies are, are more efficient 
than um, public organisations are actually doing it, making money out of it. So this has now make, been turned into a money-making scheme. So I think what we need to do is chuck it back to government. Uh, instead of private, we've, we've had this wave since Thatcher of outsourcing everything to private companies. The government needs to take responsibility for some of this and do it itself, and then we can hold the government responsible. All right, let's, let's go in the same order, uh, ah. Vicky. Okay, uh, well, there were so many questions and I have two minutes. So uh, in terms of who are the stakeholders, I think the, uh, there are uh, the employees. Uh, there are, of course, your shareholders as well. There are your supply chain, there's the community, and there's the environment, and everyone needs to take account of that. And, and in fact, it's being watched very carefully. There are all sorts of indicators you have to meet. And companies are spending quite a lot watching in particular. And I know the large firms, somebody mentioned about the large firms, there's, there's still loads of them around that produce things and that mine things in faraway places. And they need people to sort of check that this is actually happening because customers, shareholders, the uh, authorities are going to get to them. So I think a lot of what's happening is uh, because there is pressure from customers and also from shareholders and, of course, government. And a lot, just as it was mentioned right now by the, the, the person who is an auditor, um, what uh, firms have to do is follow various guidelines which otherwise get them into trouble. And that's why they're doing what they're doing. But do they always do them? I mean, the, the, the question of how do you change the culture of an organization, I don't agree at all with James that people are feeling guilty. They're out there to save their, 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 their skin if necessary. Uh, and also to survive in the long term. They may be shedding fossil fuel investments that they have because they know that if they don't do that, they're not going to get in the future either the banks to lend to them or the, the, uh, the black rocks of this world possibly to buy them. And thinking about who is a big firm, yes, the tech firms, of course, are big, but look at BlackRock. From what I understand, they have eight trillion of money that they, they manage right now. So it's the asset managers that are actually the big firms, and they have to please them. And the point made that they have to behave in a certain way because you're looking at the entire economy. Somebody made that earlier at the back there on the right. Absolutely right. So they're balancing out where they put their money. But the hypocrisy also of those people is an extraordinary fact. If you look at what happened with the Deliveroo IPO, uh, there was all this stuff about, oh, we're not going to invest in them uh, because, of course, they're not treating the people right. They're not giving them the right uh, 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 standing in their, in their uh, companies because they, they pay them little and they have no uh, health and safety stuff that they can uh, have, uh, so particularly holidays and also uh, sick pay and so on that everyone else has. Uh, but actually, what they were also saying at the same time is, actually, we're not going to buy delivery shares because regulation might change and make those people proper employees. And that's going to mean a lot more cost to the company, and therefore, the profitability is going to be reduced, and therefore, the shares aren't going to do so well. Uh, the, 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 the decision then came that they're not really employees, and shares went up very significantly. So huge amount of hypocrisy is out there by your shareholders. So if that's the case, what, how do you react as a firm? You have to actually take all that... Uh, into into account, uh, and then I think there were uh, there were questions about uh, are things really moving in the right direction within an organisation? You can't change the culture of an organisation unless you change the culture. Everyone in there. It's not the question, and I'm afraid some true a lot of the teaching that's been done doesn't achieve an awful lot. But you need to impose that culture in a different way from the top if that is what you want to achieve. And you know you have to achieve it because governments aren't going to buy your products, just as we were saying, somebody was saying earlier. Yes, it's an expensive thing to do. It's not it's not cheap, all that sort of stuff that somebody suggested. It is expensive. That's why it's the big firms with the transparency that they're having now in terms of what they're doing and that gets caught out. I mean, look at money laundering. I mean, this is you know, a bank we own, uh, NatWest. Well, don't forget, it is actually Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, they just changed their names to Fooler's. But actually, it's Royal Bank of Scotland, um, owned by us, has just been fined for money laundering. A lot of the big four, one of them, the lady with the green dress, is, is there. They've been fined again and again for appalling audits where they haven't actually seen what was going on. I used to work for one of the big four myself. Uh, I have to quickly admit, just in case someone mentions this. Uh, but that is what is going on uh, right now. So, so you, ca you cannot, you've got to watch what you're doing in a firm and you've got to watch what's happening. Final point, uh, the idea of separation between firms and, and government and have we passed it all to, to firms? I mean, the truth is that there, there is still 
This idea that there's no longer a class issue is just not true. I mean, KPMG has said they want to increase the number of working class people, including children of lorry drivers, who very quickly are not going to be working class anymore. <laughs> be earning so much more. Um, to 29% over a period of time. So I was asked on some radio interview, why 29%? It's because that's the, the percentage of the population who are actually working class, more or less. Uh, that's what they're doing. Within organisations, there's still a huge gap between the lower paid and the people at the top. So we mustn't forget, there's a huge gap between what women earn and men earn, still there. And the, the job reviews, that, the pay reviews that came out, which were postponed for a while because of COVID and we've gone backwards, showed very clearly the huge differentials that still exist. We've even found out at the top, you know, that women and non-executive directors, and we're so proud, we have 35% of them now in the FTSE 350 and FTSE 100 as well, they're getting 40% pay less than the men. Now, the only way in which some of those improvements have happened is because of government regulation. That's why firms have pr progressively improved what they're doing. And they're doing more because of the fear of more regulation. If there hasn't been a separation between government and business. There never was, and actually, there never should have been. Thank you. Keep cool. clapping now to the end. Oh, come on, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that deserved a round of applause. Uh, I was, before I was, uh, I was trying to make a, I wanted to address the point the gentleman made about the, the Benetton adverts, which I think is a very good one. Uh, but I think I ought to address your point, which is everyone in here hates LGBT. I think you were joking, or, yeah, I think you were. But maybe someone thought you weren't. So uh, I, I, I think, you know, when I was talking about rainbows and the police and, and, and all of that, I don't... I have no problem with any community. My issue is I resent being trained into not being racist when I'm already not racist. My parents brought me up. <laughs> to treat everybody equally and to see people as human beings first. I resent the fact that when I look at you now, I see a brown woman. I resent that because we are human beings and we should look at each other as that. And so when I, I'm talking about opposing all the stuff, I'm opposing the ideology of brainwashing people into seeing each other as their demographic characteristics instead of human beings. So that's where I'm coming from. At. And that's why I make the point about the United Colors of Benetton, which I think is a really good one, sir, because the point of those adverts, and I get your, what you're saying, they were controversial at the time, but the message was one of uniting people. Right, the united colors of Benetton, instead of the divisive shit that we get now from companies like Gillette, where they're training people to think of themselves as toxic because they're men. Right, I don't need a moral lecture from Mr. Burns off The Simpsons. Right, <laughs> I don't. Can you just go back to doing what you do best, which is training 12 year olds to make razor blades for a dollar a day? Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Right, thank you. And I'll keep it brief. And there have been plenty of opinions. And I'm just going to tell you two tales about Nike, if I may. And in the 80s and 90s, Nike went to China and they started producing sneakers in China by paying their labor, sometimes you know, teenagers who came from the countryside to work in the factories, about a dollar or two a day. And there was a huge backlash in America um, in terms of slave labor. And, and, and Nike had a big campaign and apologized, um, but of course continued you know, using the labor. But what we actually looked at, this is a case I always teach in the business school, is that those dollar or two were a huge amount for the laborers who, who worked there. And their factory was in a town called Shenzhen that had started with maybe 70, you know, fisher, fishermen, households. Today it's 30 million inhabitants, one of the most uh, sort of exciting cities in Asia. It's built on that dollar a day, and that dollar a day bought houses for people for generations. So that's one story. Fast forward 2021, Nike again, this time in China once again, and Nike together with H&M and Burberry had made a statement that they did not know they were using the Xinjiang cotton and that um, they 
apologize for doing so. They decided not to use Xinjiang cotton because the Uyghur uh, minority issue in China, and they were boycotted by the Chinese consumers, and the, some of the stores was smashed, and none of the companies apologized. They made statements that this is our value, and we uphold our value. And today, Nike is one of the biggest brands in China that continue to sell. They have huge consumer loyalty. So I just want to leave the stories to you. You can make your own conclusions. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'll try and be brief and we'll have a slightly scattergun approach to try and answer everyone's questions. Performative, really good phrase that somebody used. Um, it reminded me of the, no the story of Amazon publicly backing Marcus Rashford but then still not paying their staff properly um, and that led to the same children that Marcus Rashford was helping having to go to food banks. Uh, the hypocrisy is there in every single sense. Um, profit, one of the most crass uh, sort of shows of Nike just wanting to focus on profits other than using uh, slave labour uh, and aiding a genocide in China um, was Nike's change of the statement after the horrific George Floyd murder saying, just don't do it, which led to making them a fortune. Whether they want to, you know, in my opinion, this makes me think maybe just more woke actions and less woke words. Uh, maybe they should actually stop supporting a genocide, stop not paying people to make their products and not going out there and sort of crass, crass, oh God, I don't even know how to say it, um, making a crass statement on the basis of the murder of a man in America and jumping on a movement to make them profit. I found it to be utterly disgusting. And there are loads of examples of that, including companies like Pretty Little Thing. Um, another thing that somebody mentioned made me think that maybe the anger we have is because the wokeness doesn't include them. Maybe we're just angry because it doesn't include our section of society and we don't feel seen. And maybe that's a ridiculous thing to say, but something like class, you know, people in working class communities get frustrated that they're not included in these things in companies. You have to be a certain color or sexuality to be included, and they get frustrated when they're from some of the poorest areas of, of the country. I totally understand that, but maybe you actually want more wokeness, not less. Just something to think about. Um, <laughs> sorry to throwing that bomb in there. Um, yeah, more voices to be, the, the whole idea of voices being heard, who's actually, you know, what voices are being listened to to come up with these ideas. Well, actually, the voices that are being listened to are the voices that arguably have been ignored and outcasted for generations or centuries or decades. That would be my argument. In my opinion, there is uh, a move too far in one direction and a balance needs to be found in certain sectors. I'm not saying that it's completely right in certain areas and there has to be a balance, but some of these, you know, sections of society do feel like they've been ignored and do feel like this is reasonable. And we're talking about, you know, women still not being paid the same 40% less. All of these things, you know, ethnic minorities. There are lots of groups, if you just look at the statistics... They're the same for the same work, by the way, right? Well, it's no, not actually, true. Not, it's not, not, true. not, not now. It's not, Different it's not true. Sorry, but th th it's not true. In, it's you know, true. in the most senior people in senior companies, are women are paid 40% less, as has just been told. So these things are still going on, and a balance needs to be found. So yeah, the sum up is more woke actions, less woke words. Thank you. Uh, just, just before I bring James in uh, last week, I just when, when I um, when I saw the England football team in Budapest get roundly booed when they took the knee. I did think perhaps that that population of that country, which has been occupied and invaded over centuries, might not wish to be lectured on equality by some millionaire footballers. Yeah. And I think there's a lack of kind of consciousness about uh, you know, what, what the impact of some of these things, which appears to be all very good and everything else, can be on some people who are not themselves privileged in any recognisable way. James? Well, just on that point, I think... Uh, I'm sorry to be old-fashioned, Constantine, but I, I think the ruling class is totally out of touch with popular opinion, and that's what happened at Budapest. And I'm sure you'd agree with that, right? Um, so, you know, it, it, I should have said it's a top-down phenomenon ultimately. Obviously, workers 
and regulation, which I actually think is, is top down as well. But workers do reinforce it. You can't get a job and all of that. That's, you know, it's a self-reinforcing thing. But I think the ultimate first cause is um, which president introduced affirmative action in the United States? Americans cannot, was it something I said, sir? No, no. Uh, <laughs> Americans cannot reply. Which president introduced it? Anybody know? Nixon. 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 Tricky dicky. You know, so uh, I think that, you know, I, I want to agree um, very much with uh, Vicky because I think magnanimity to one's opponents is a big thing that we need to develop if we are hostile to woke. If we call them woke and just cock a snook, it's not going to do it, right? And when she said, quite rightly, that KPMG wants to increase its working class representation, as Reagan said, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're at the start of the woke phenomenon, really, and, and it's going to embrace much more stuff. The good news is that since those motorists pulled off Insulate Britain from the N25 last week, we're also at the start of some resistance uh, to this, because there's only so much that you can go along with looking at their hypocrisy. Having said that, I don't think hypocrisy makes the argument. If it did, because the hypocrisy is so egregious, uh, you know, we wouldn't be having this debate. So just to, to, to wind up, what is to be done? We mustn't believe the hype. We can't be so distant from the population on the wards being paid 20,000, 25,000 a, uh, a year. We can't be so distant from them that we don't recognize the incipient spirit of revolt. That will grow. I say that as a forecaster, and it will grow as night follows day. Mm. So let's look out for that, not idealise it, but recognise that an opposition will build.